And we're back. Okay. All right, talk about types of props. We were talking about the constant speed. Oops. Constant speed prop that has constant speed, plus you can add feathering, plus you can add beta range. Um, and we'll talk about those more. And I'll throw in the test club. What kind of club is that? So test clubs are used for testing test engines. They're much, much shorter, usually four blades, uh, wooden. And it's designed so that all of the air movement is as close to the core of the engine as possible. And they're rated at uh, the horsepower. So each one would be specific for that horsepower. So like if you were testing an aircraft, we did a lot of um, the IO360 200 horse engines. So you get 200 horse engine, you get 200 horse test club. And when you run up the engine to it would go all the way up to right about red line and right there, 200 horse. So it was designed to kind of limit it right at the red line. So they sound cool. They buzz when they go kind of like, whoa. Mm -hmm. So, all right, test club, got that? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's see, constant speed, reversion, test club, short prop that directs cooling air along the engine designed to absorb all of the engine horsepower. All right, that was 11 types of props. And let's talk specifically about the fixed pitch props. Well, we pretty much covered the nomenclature and such on it. So in, it would make sense that we start with what we started with, wood props. So let's watch, oops. This is going to be a problem, isn't it? When you were uh, explaining the story of like, what, like repitching, yeah, uh, was that with a wood prop or a metal prop? Yeah, just splinters if you try and do it with wood. Looks good to me. Isn't this just the saddest sight in general aviation? A hangar-bound airplane with the engine ripped out of its nose. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb and Aviation Consumer. This is our 1938 J3C Cub. We're getting an engine overhaul and we're upgrading from a 65 horsepower engine to a 75 horsepower engine. And in order to absorb that enormous amount of torque, we're going to need a new one of these, a sentient wooden prop. Now, Ascension it still has a pretty lively business building wooden props, and we're going to take a look at how they do it. And to learn how these props are made, we've come to Sensenic, which is in Plant City, right near the airport in Plant City, south of Lakeland. And Don Rao is going to run us through the process of how wooden props are made. All of our blank serves manufactured from laminated birch. Uh, they can have uh, any number of different laminations from four up to six or eight depending on the propeller design. The wood is selected based on color and for grain and lack of knots, and then uh, the patterns are laid up and marked off based on uh, the different uh, the prop designs. And then once we've selected the boards and they are planed down to finished thickness, then they are laminated using resorcinol. After a seven to 10 day cure, they are then sent off to the CNC area for CNC machining. After the blank is cured for seven to ten days, we then bring the blank over to mill the hub face and uh, bore the bolt holes and uh, the center bore. And that's done in a CNC vertical mill using a variety of tools, drills, mills, chamfer tools. So once it leaves this machine, the entire hub will be complete with all the bolt holes, center bore, and chamfers. And the process takes about five to 10 minutes, depending on the size of the center bore and the number of holes that go in the propeller. After the propeller hubs are milled, then all the uh, propellers are mounted onto our CNC router where we profile the blade shape. And this is done, uh, can be done one at a time or up to five propellers at a time. Even though the propellers are CNC profiled, they still need hand finishing and hand work. So the propellers are hand carved using spoke shaves and sandpaper and we utilize airfoil templates to maintain template fit and protractors to maintain blade angle on the backside of the prop. And 
All the while doing this, the propeller must maintain a balance and be carved to within a balance tolerance. After carving, a lot of our propellers actually get a fiberglass covering over them for environmental protection. And this is that operation right here. We use a wet layup system using a two-part epoxy and a fiberglass cloth that is uh, squeegeed and uh, peel plied over for application. We use a marine spar varnish for our clear finish, very durable and will darken to a very nice patina over time. After painting, the propellers come out for final inspection and application of the famous Sensenic trademark before they get packaged into custom cardboard boxes for shipping. Oh, and by the way, we often get asked about that metal sleeve in the center of the propeller. That's actually not a metal sleeve, that is an aluminum pigmented paste that we paint in there to seal the end grain. You can find out more about Sensenic props on www.sensenic.com. I often wonder how old that video is, and just the OSHA violations alone. I mean, <laughs> There was one scene where the guy's putting the, you're probably watching him put the fiberglass on. I looked up at the microwave that was just covered in fiberglass. The guy painting wearing, wearing you know, basketball shorts. And it's like, you know. The uh, Sensenich trademark, that little sticker. Yeah. So they balance this whole thing out. I mean, they just throw the stickers on there. Not the stickers. Cut it off any other way. You put one on each side. <laughs> They do have to be on the same spot. So, all right. So, fixed pitch props. I'll leave it right here for a few minutes. Fixed pitch props. Uh, let's see, we got the wood props. Originally, all propellers are made of wood. Several laminations of straight grain wood, finished to correct size and shape. Tip is the tip fabric is applied to the outboard, usually about 12 to 15 inches. That's the fabric right there. And uh, that reinforces the very thin tips. I think it's pretty thin out there with some wood. Um, they're varnished and metal tipping is applied to the leading edge. Metal tipping is brass, oh, I'll just write this. Fixed pitch props, all right, so we saw the video. We'll do this, yeah, wood props. Wood props are very sensitive, and they do require a lot of care. I had one customer who, I don't want to say he took it to the extreme, but he, he listened to me, and so I had, to, I had to do what I told him to do. And he kept his airplane out by the river in a shade hanger, so it's exposed to the elements. And he had nice little marine covers that went on, like a boat maker or canvas maker and made them, so he always kept it nice and covered. You always keep it perfectly horizontal, never keep it twisted because the downward blade will collect more moisture and cause an imbalance. Mm -hmm. He would have me go out and uh, loosen all the bolts and retorque it like every three months. And the bolt torque is really low on these props. It's surprising. I think it's like a, you know, he had a champ. I want to say it was in the neighborhood of like 100 inch pounds was all it was. What? And you have to be very careful to not go 100 inch pounds, 100 inch pounds because it pulls the blade in, crushes it here, and then it just, then your tracking's all off. You have to go real <laughs> careful, star pattern, and work it up slowly, even to 100 inch pounds. So, all right, so I said wood props. I just did that, right? So, under wood props, we got um, originally, I don't want to write this stuff, paid by the word. Originally, all props were wood. So that was the uh, that was the original, the OG prop. I'm learning. All right. Made of several laminations. Of straight grain wood. What kind of wood would they use? You think it's birch? Did you say birch? Good job, man. Is that all blades or is that since 
I don't believe there's anybody else making wood props. Oh, probably. No. <laughs> so. I'm guessing they're going to be taken away eventually, right? Oh, no, no. No? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's hard to get more <laughs> aluminum props. Why? It's hard to get more aluminum props. You might run out of wood. <laughs> Finish to correct size and shape. I'm impressed every time I watch that video. That one guy who's hand scraping that, I'm just like, damn, that 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 guy, he's yeah. amazing. He amazes me. Uh, tip is uh, tip fabric is applied tip. Applied to outboard. B O A R outboard. Usually about twelve to fifteen inches. I know that video they showed him doing the whole thing. I don't remember seeing a sense niche with it like that. So this reinforces the thin tips. This reinforces the thin tips. Uh, metal propellers are more efficient because the hubs can be thinner. So there's more of an effective airfoil near the hub on metal props. But the pro to the wood props are so much lighter. They are varnished. What does that mean? Yeah, it's like a... a like a clear paint okay now I don't have this uh, maybe I have it later but I'm kind of running out of time so I'll just kind of throw this out there so you know I told you that the torque is really critical you want to keep them horizontal when they're stored so because the downward blade will collect moisture and then you'll have an imbalance um, varnishing you, you have to really pay attention to these props and when the varnish starts when it needs a, a coat of varnish you have to varnish it but you have to be extremely careful to apply equal amounts of varnish to both sides or the prop is imbalanced. You get an imbalanced prop, it's like driving down the road with an out-of-balance tire. It just shakes the whole airplane, so you don't want that. Um, I think that might be one of the Q&A questions somewhere about, you know, how can you balance one of these props? You can add more varnish to the lighter blade. Yeah. What is, like, the amount that, that it can be off? Like, what is the tolerance between... The oh, you don't want it any at all. Do you, you want it as close, as close to zero as possible? I don't know what the, I'm going to say it's zero because when you balance a prop, you balance it to zero. Mm -hmm. So when you put it on a prop balancer, if you're doing it uh, static and you put it out horizontal and one tip starts to go, that's, that's a no-go. Yeah. You're going to add some, some wool, some um, lead wool, solder, or varnish to the light blade. And then when you get done with that, you put it on the aircraft and you do a dynamic balance and then add weights on the, on the aircraft as it runs. Uh, let's see, varnish. Metal tipping is applied to leading edge. To leading edge. Uh, metal is brass. Um, brass, stainless, or manel. Most of the wood props, it's brass. Most of the new composites are stainless or manel. Protects leading edge. I have on here from cracked, or, or from rocks. We'll put that protects rocks, but obviously it's Rocks, rain, bugs, Debris. hamsters. Oh. <laughs> they always die in most tragic ways. <laughs> They're attached with countersunk screws. And I believe this is one of your Q and A questions. Sounds familiar. Attached with countersunk screws in the thick section. and rivets in the thin. Uh, 
Um, screws are safety with solder. And small, about number 60 inch, number 60 drill bits. Holes are drilled. in the metal tip to allow moisture to escape. tends to absorb moisture. Yeah. Now, it shouldn't if you have that. It's, I think it's called urethra bond. <laughs> it goes, I told you guys about that, in that, that, metal, that metal paste they talked about. I'm pretty sure that's urethra bond that we used for the inside of crankshafts, same stuff. So that's sealed. The end grain is sealed. Um, still have bolt holes. Just, you know, what is? It just tends to swell and absorb moisture. So... Do you want some way to wick it out? I, I have a hard time. I don't see the dripping out these little holes. I don't yeah. know. In fact, I see the blade with them facing up as being more of a problem. And the water gets into little holes, but I don't know. It's just what they say and what they do. It's like evaporation allows. Yeah. Let's see. So there we go. So, yes, we have the fabric sheathing, hub assembly. We got the... Notch to prevent buckling when forming. Yeah, I suppose so. Little drain holes. Solder the screws. That's nice. Oh. All right. I think I have more in a section called maintenance, but uh, so we'll move on. Um, Thirteen. The metal props. That would be aluminum is the most common. I only know of one steel propeller, and we actually, that's the, our ground adjustable. That's, those are steel. Uh, benefits. Apparently there's some benefits. They are thinner. More efficient airfoils. So here we go. Thinner. More efficient airfoil. Uh, better engine cooling due to airfoil shape near the hub. to airfoil shape near hub uh, less maintenance not a lot less you don't have to varnish them obviously you don't have to go out and retorque them all the time so you don't have to paint them just as much. In fact, like maybe more. Because the paint slides off the end because <laughs> it tripped before, so you got to deal with that all the time. Uh, I need to definitely pull this back a little bit. I was going to go over part numbers. But I'm going to let you kind of work through that in in uh, the lab because it's really not that big of a deal. Um, I'll just give you an example. If I had a, and it, eh, no, I'm not gonna because Sensnitz does it one way, Macaulay does it another, so it's really not much point in even getting into that. Um, we'll put this though, typically, typically, what do I wanna say? Different prop versions allowed for each aircraft. 
different prop versions for each aircraft. For each aircraft, let me see. Within each version, there is a static RPM tolerance. Remember we talked about that the other day? Um, let's see. Within each version also, uh, props are often pitched, props are often pitched, which is to say the blade angle changes, by about two inches difference to create three possibilities. So we can have a climb prop. That would be high RPM. Higher low pitch. Yep. Low blade angle. Not taking a big bite. Not taking big bites. Take little bites. Climb props. That's high RPM. Um, then we can have a cruise prop. So that would be lower RPM with a high pitch or high blade angle. And all, all around. What would be a better word for that? Mid-range, all around. So that would just be middle, middle RPM. Slash middle pitch. Just, just pick it right in between the two. Eco prop. I refuse. <laughs> I do not know why this would be there, so we'll just put it like that. So resonant frequencies. One of the downsides of metal props, aluminum props, metal, I said metal props, metal props, is that they are, metal props are subject to resonant frequencies. I remember I built an engine for uh, a guy with a Mooney. So it was a four-cylinder engine. I remember it well because it was really interesting how so many things were interesting. One, it was the worst worst crankshaft I'd ever pulled out of an engine. He, he complained of low oil pressure. And he said, man, I just I can't get the oil pressure up. So he brought me the engine and he said, I guess it's time for an overhaul. So he brought in the engine and, and I, the front mains were like standard and the rear was like minus six. I mean, it just was this, and it was bad. So I built this engine and, and you know, we tested it and everything. And then we sent it off because I think he had a problem in Montana or something. So I had to truck it up to Montana to get it back on the airplane. And man, he called and he was like, man, this engine just, Kevin, it, you know, it just runs terrible. And uh, it was because when they took the engine off the crate and then put it on the airplane, they pulled the mags off because it wouldn't go inside of the, the uh, motor mount. The mechanic mistimed one of the mags. So yeah, it ran crappy for that reason. So I had to deal with that. And then he, instead of having his prop overhauled, he bought a three blade prop. And he brought it in after even the, the, the issue with the mag and stuff and uh, he just, you had us check it out. I said, it just runs so rough. He goes, this engine was really smooth and it's just terrible. 
and we just couldn't find anything wrong with it. And he got so fed up that he finally took his three blade prop off and bought a new two blade. And he called me up. So this is the smoothest machine I've ever flown in my life. Is it just something about the three blade and the four power pulses just didn't match up on this engine. And I think it had a lot to do with, you know, this particular airframe wasn't built out of the factory with a two blade. And so it was a Lycoming four cylinder, which um, these are big board engines. And, you know, it's a lot of horsepower for only four cylinders. I probably think that was a 200 horse version. And so uh, Lycoming does use big counterweights in there to smooth it out. I just don't think those counterweights were designed for the three blade impulse. It's just, so it's just weird how, you know, you can get into something. And that was his thing. He's like, well, I guess four just doesn't go into three. You know, it just mathematically doesn't work out. I'm like, well, unless it's 12. But, you know, but that yeah, was just his thing. He said once he, so he hated that. And it's, which is funny. I've, you know, done a lot of talking with other uh, 182 owners because it's a big deal. Do you go from the, the two blade that they came with to the three blade? You know, they look cooler. They're quieter. They climb better. You lose a little bit of forward um, airspeed. But um, a lot of people say they're, they're not as smooth. But six does go into three. So I don't know. Um, okay, so but you do get these resonant frequencies we talked about the other day where it's just they come out of the factory and it's like it's, it's always my joke. It's something about aviation where if it doesn't work right, it seems to be okay if you just placard it. You know, you guys will see that. It's like, oh, it doesn't work. Well, as long as it's placarded that it, it's in off, then, then you're okay. So, you know, so wow, this thing really shakes really bad between these RPM ranges. It's like so bad we could actually lose the propeller. Well, it's placarded. <laughs> Now, as long as you've warned somebody. Yeah. Um, so these frequencies. Frequencies uh, may cause excessive vibration. Uh, and may even lead to the loss of the aircraft vibration and even lead to the loss. Not that you're going to be able to find it. it. It crashes. Loss of aircraft. I have to say that because afterwards I'll get somebody coming up. How come they can't find the aircraft? <laughs> that goes invisible. Where do you So some engine propeller combinations have RPM range restrictions. Combinations have RPM restrictions. I have a service bolt I referenced here, but I don't remember. I don't have a copy of it. Um, this is uh, SAIB NE08021. So example, you, see, you may see this on the instrument panel. Avoid continuous operation operation between 2000 and 2,250 RPM. You might see something like that. So as long as you're above it, as long as you're below it. Yep. Don't stay in it. On the way through, on the way through, and you're fine. But don't 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 dwaddle there. Uh, may mandate. May mandate the installation of a colored arc on the tack. Tech. So yellow would be a cautionary range. Like only a brief moment of time. Like you might have for takeoff only, they'd, they'd have that. Or you may even have a red arc. Red arc, um, critical vibration.
kind of seems like an engineering mistake if you ask me. Yeah. So crit critical vibration range would just mean the just, resonant frequency. Yep. Do not just don't stick around in there. By the way, on a, you know, you talk about annual inspections and, and stuff like that. And until you start getting into, it's always, you know, things you don't know. Um, this is where a lot of people get into trouble with stuff like this. You know, you can look over at an aircraft and think, man, this thing is just beautiful. And I can't find a single thing wrong with it. And, you know, not an oil leak and it runs perfect, does all this. But, you know, if you miss stuff like this, you don't look at the POH and go down the page. It has every single data plate that's supposed to be on the engine in every single location and then go in the type certificate data sheet where they have the list of notes where you're supposed to have every note that is included on the instrument panel and around the panel you know it's those little things that they get you on i did a, a plane one time that i think i told you guys it i was i was supposed to do that i did i did do the annual inspection but the airplane was headed for an instrument shop immediately following our restoration so we just had to kind of mock it up, but it had to be airworthy, which means all the seats and the weight and balance and all the instruments, but it was going to go and get brand new everything. So, um, but I had to do the annual. And so I actually, I just took scotch and masking tape and I printed every single label and put them all, but it was on masking tape, which is hundred percent legal. And then I left for the day to go actually go teach. This is a long time ago. And uh, when I came in in the morning, the airplane, they told me the airplane to crash that night. Yeah, and uh, it, was, it was almost kind of funny, but, you know, it was like, hey, you know, thank God that plane's finally gone. We've been working on it for years. It was an AOPA giveaway plane. You guys are familiar with AOPA? And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was, you know, it's all publicized. It's been the AOPA magazine. Everybody's following it, you know, got the reporter guy there. And, uh, you know, it, it was a long road, man. We finally got this thing out the damn shop. And they came in the morning, just, woo, Pacer's gone. And uh, they're like, do you not know? I'm like, no, what? I'm like, I had an off-field landing last night. I flipped it over on its back. FA will be here in about 20 minutes, and you forgot to sign the logbooks for the annual inspection when we were out flying it. So you need to sign the annual inspection real quick before the FA gets here. <laughs> so, huh? I did finish. I did finish, and I had all those little stickers. And it's believed that possibly it was because one of the tanks ran dry because you were not supposed to fly it on less than one third tank gallons, one third capacity in a tank. And it was on that tank, but I had it stickered right there where it's supposed to be. Oh, nice. So uh, nothing to fear. I mean, I did my job, but you know, those are the things that'll get you. Um, most common failure, most common failure. Not that it's a big deal um, associated with this. is um, just a loss of is blade tip separation. Not a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. The results from a fatigue crack. And of course, failure of the propeller hub or blade could occur, so. Talked about the wood prop. Talked about the metal. Not a lot to say about the metal prop. I mean, they exist. They exist. Most of the, you know, we've talked about the theory. Most of what you have to deal with is uh, taking care of them, dressing the leading edge from cracks and stuff, um, sending them off for overhaul, painting them. Um, you know. Gosh, there's actually so much that can be said about them. You just learn so much about the maintenance aspect of it, which, you know, is not on your tests, sadly enough. Notice that they're painted. A lot of people have highly polished propellers. 
couple of years ago, the FAA just really started cracking down on that. They said there's only one propeller manufacturer. They didn't say which one it is. I think it's an antique. And they, actually, I think it's um, probably Hamilton Standard that has the ability to polish it in their maintenance manual. All the other maintenance manuals say you will alodyne and paint. So you're supposed to alodyne them whenever you have bare metal, painted. Um, it's an aluminum conversion coating. So you guys didn't do that with Phil? You acid etch something, and then, uh, maybe you do it with Larry. But it's um, like this gold uh, colored conversion coating. So it, like you know how aluminum oxidizes and protects itself from corrosion? Mm -hmm. This accelerates that process and puts it right on top. Okay. So it just starts right there. And it also gives paint, cool. paint something yeah. to it. It went yeah. over very slightly. Yeah, good, good paint adhesion. So you have to do that. It just, it can't stress enough that you got to watch the leading edges. You know, you just can't let rock chips get away because you'll get a crack forms, and once you get a crack form, you lose your tip. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna crash. You can lose your aircraft. Um, spinners are insanely expensive. Um, inside there, you have the bulkheads. They tend to crack really easy. And so you're, you know, every year you got to take the spinner off. You got to look in there. You have to inspect the bulkheads that hold it in place. Um, a lot of times they're dynamically balanced assemblies. So you always have to make sure that the propeller spinner goes on exactly the way you took it off. You can't turn it 180 and put it on. It'll fit, but you throw the whole thing out of balance. Yeah. Uh, hand prop planes. See, I kind of have a plane, I guess. You said like pushing on them that can damage and warp them. Okay. There's a difference between pushing onto hand prop and pushing an airplane back by the prop. Okay. A huge difference. If you're doing one every day, maybe two or three times a day, I figure. No, you can hand prop the thing for its entire life. If you do it right, you're not pushing on it. Okay. You're uh, pushing in the direction of rotation. Yeah. Which is what happens. Now, granted, some people, when they hand prop, they teach different things, right? Um, and I've had to hand prop a lot of damn planes. I hate it. Some people say, oh, don't wrap your fingers around it because it'll kick back. So push against it. And okay, when you're doing that, you're relying on the friction from you pushing forward. Yeah. I don't want to be pushing forward into the plane. I think that this is right, me, I've done a lot of them. The risk of me, of it kicking back and grabbing my fingers and pulling me into the prop are so minuscule as compared to me pushing hard enough to pull it through, slipping forward. No, I don't do that. So I grab it by, and I, I go backwards, right? And I use the tips of my fingers, not my whole hand, but just the, just the tips so I can get a good bite on it. Started a lot of damn engines that way. Um, yeah, so that's the way I do it. There was something else profound. Oh, um, tracking, prop tracking. I know I've got it in here somewhere, and we'll talk about it, but you know, it's time that I talk to you guys about propeller tracking. So propeller tracking is where one blade comes through, and when the other one comes through, it's in the exact same plane. You don't have one here and one here, right? The blade's got to be exact. And there's all different ways of, you can see it in the books, how they do it. And, you know, sometimes they'll put the blade straight up and down. And you got to get a stack of wood that fits just perfect underneath that blade. And then you kind of mark it. You know, you guys got to think more about a 3D world. So this prop goes around in a circle. So... I could pretty much have that blade at any height from all the way down here to all the way up here. <laughs> so, you know, I always laugh watching you guys. I have fun right up until I tell you how to really do it. And so you look it around, you, you guys had a toolbox on its side scraping it. Who was that? Dragging toolboxes. It was you guys, yeah, dragging toolboxes across the ground. You know, I got somebody else, you know, they got, you know, three blocks of wood. Uh, two spray cans of paint with another block of wood and then they're you know AC 4313 and then you know a remote control on top you know everybody's trying to get you know what the prop goes around like this just grab a freaking stool and put it right here and when the prop comes around and it's right there hey look it fits right there <laughs> and keep spinning yeah well you can see what I'm saying so you don't have to like the props down here get the perfect thing underneath it and all that stuff if the, when the prop comes around, just find anything you can, right? If it's right here, just bring this up so it's right there. It's the same plane if it's going this way or that way or this way. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 So anything will work as long as it's nice and stable. You bring the prop up and you mark where the tip goes. You bring the other one. you got to watch it because it looks like when they come across because of their angle. When they come down, you're gonna, it's going to be a little different. So you've got to be careful and kind of mark it. 
uh, in the right manner, but you know, you don't have to go exactly underneath it. You can go off to the side. <laughs> Use a table, something that doesn't move. Uh, all right, composite props. <sighs> Composite props are becoming very common. Um, oh, look, that must have been my little example right there. I was telling somebody. Use a little stool right there. Yeah. Well, that's on there. All right, pro uh, composite props are becoming very common. Uh, gosh, when I was in the field, this was the big deal, the Ivo prop. And I want to say that this is a fascinating story about the guy who invented these. Uh, Ivan, I believe his name was, and he was out of Russia. Sir and I, uh huh. And I, is it Sir Ivan? It might be. Um, I, I barely know the story, but it was, it's one of those rags to riches kind of story where he came out of Russia and brought the prop and all this kind of stuff. And, and I've flown some planes with those. They're, they're kind of weird. They, they flex. They can, I don't normally do this, but if you stand in line with it and watch when somebody changes RPM, you'll see a little resonant flex oh. through. Uh, we have one on the little um, home built when you guys walk in. Um, for the most part, uh, composite props these days um, well, MT is the big, big one. They're, they're the big one now. Um, it's hand-selected, multiple laminated German ash. It's got to be German. Ach du Liebe. Covered by epoxy fiberglass and sealed by a coating of acrylic polyurethane paint. So a composite prop is what? Wood. Wood prop covered by epoxy fiberglass and sealed the acrylic paint. So, and then you put on the leading edge... Stainless steel tip. What does this sound like? A wood prop. Wooden prop, yeah. A wood prop with extra steps. Yeah. Um, let's see, the one on the sky catcher. I don't think I've ever seen a sky catcher. I may have. It's a light sport thing, this little thing out over here. Sky catcher. Macaulay makes that one. Um, let's see, all composite two blade fixed pitch propeller specifically designed for this particular engine. Consists of a continuous fiber single piece design given high strength and lightweight. Uh, weighs 9.3 pounds. That's all I got. Ivoprop. Oh, this one's carbon fiber. Ivoprop is carbon fiber. fiber. Yep. Um, all right. Do you want me to write all that stuff? No. We'll do this though. You were going to write it anyway. Where are we at? Composite. There. Talked about composite. We talked about the MT. It's actually MT. That's how they do it. The Ivoprop. That's uh, wood with fiberglass. Ivoprop is carbon fiber. There we go. Some pros and cons. Oh, we have a uh, MT prop on our 172 out there. They're, they're interesting in, in the repair procedures. Um, you just put epoxy resin in depending on what the damage is and fill, fill the damage. Keep on it going. Depends on what it is. If not, send it back. That would not be a prop strike. Technically, if you have a chip and a ding, and they'll let you send it in without calling it a prop strike. All right. With that epoxy to fill that prop chip or whatever, would that not throw the prop out of balance? Yup. It would? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, if you change okay. the weight on it. Like, but apparently it's just not their concern. It's like not enough of, a, of an issue. I don't know. Huh. Well, you know what I would do? Just knock out a chunk of one of the other blades, um. about the same, and then fill it. No, don't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hey, sorry, boss, man. I kind of knocked too big of a chunk. You want me to knock more out of that side over there? A lot of times there are three blades, too, so you can't really uh, balance it. You have to knock one out of both of them, yeah.